Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast. This week, in a new approach for us, Madden America's news editor Justin Carter interviews Professor Michael O'Loughlin. Professor O'Loughlin is a college professor and researcher at Adelphi University on Long Island, New York, and a licensed psychologist and psychoanalyst in private practice. It's a wide-ranging and fascinating discussion which I'm sure you will enjoy hearing. So welcome to the Madden America podcast. I'm Justin Carter and I'm a news editor for the Madden America site. For those who haven't checked out that part of the website before, we provide daily coverage of the latest mental health research that challenges the predominant biomedical paradigm in psychiatry and psychology. Today, I am fortunate to be interviewing Dr. Michael O'Loughlin, a critical psychologist and psychoanalyst who works as a professor and researcher at Adelphi University in Long Island, New York. Dr. O'Loughlin, welcome to the Madden America podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here talking with you today, Justin. Thank you. To begin, uh, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and what brought you to the fields of critical psychology and psychoanalysis? Sure. I I grew up in Ireland and I began my professional life as a teacher, but my family history has always been, I grew up in a family that was quite poor in a society that at the time I grew up uh, was, was filled with inequality. And I grew up deeply sensitive to inequality and injustice and was very sensitive to social justice issues all of my life. So as a young man in college, I was involved in in community protests, and I worked in a prison doing literacy projects and lots of charity work. So I've always had an interest in marginalization, and that interest has carried me through my professional life. I've done lots of work around poverty issues over the years and issues of racial inequality and social justice. And more recently, I got interested in in psychiatry. And that happened because I happened to get an appointment at Adelphi University in clinical psychology. And it became apparent to me very quickly there wasn't a single required course on trauma and there wasn't a single required course on madness and psychosis. And I began to see there was a need to be filled. And I returned to my critical roots. I'd read critical psychology before, but I returned to my roots and started reading critical psychiatry and propose two courses, which I now teach in alternating years. One is called Trauma with a Focus on Intergenerational Trauma and the Way in Which Our History Shapes Our Being. And listeners might be interested to know I've done a lot of autobiographical writing to help big zoom and understand the way the deprivations and injustices of my own childhood have shaped me. In particular, I was hospitalized for the first two years of my life, and that was very formative in helping me think about the difficulties institutions pose for people. So one one strand of my work has been to do with intergenerational trauma and the role of history in our experience, including ancestral experiences that sometimes go back hundreds and even thousands of years. Selma Freyberg, for instance, talked about how people who suffer trauma that gives them difficulties in child rearing, you could trace those difficulties back 10 generations. I think uh, Freyberg was probably a little conservative. I would say you could go back much, much further. The second course I developed was, and by the way, both of these courses are viewable, my syllabi are viewable on my website. The second of these courses uh, was on madness and psychosis. And I began to, once I began teaching this to our clinical psychology students, I realized that the material was perceived by them as radical. They were really finding that the conceptual leap from conventional clinical psychology, which is a very mainstream, conservative establishment discipline, to critical psychology and conceptions of madness that are based upon multiple frames, including experts by experience points of view, was really a huge leap for them. So I became interested in that. I started working at the Austin Riggs Center in the Berkshires in Massachusetts, uh, studying interviews with some of their hospital patients with a colleague, Marilyn Charles. And we worked on that project since 2008. In fact, we're still working together at that institution. But one of the things I realized is that Austin Riggs is a institution that's filled with very privileged people. It's, it's almost exclusively white, and it's a very affluent group of people who have the resources to go to a very expensive place. And I became interested in seeing if I could find a way to tell stories that represented a much more diverse group of people, and particularly those who were indigent and who were ethnically, culturally, and so on diverse, so that we could see the range of those stories. As I've been reading this work, I've become really persuaded that change in the field 
while change in the field is very difficult, the only possibility for change, I believe, comes from our capacity to generate counter narratives. And for me, those two counter narratives are of two kinds. One is critical narratives, such as the critical psychiatry movement, that raises serious questions about the foundation of the field, the relationship between pharmacology and the delivery of services to persons with psychiatric stress. The second one is enhancing the space for persons who have stories to tell so that those narratives influence the field. I mean, Gail Hornstein's book, for instance, Agnes's Jacket, was influential in showing the power of story, as have been the seven or 800 uh, personal narratives that, that I'm aware of that have been written in this field, trying to call attention to the suffering, the humanity, the potential, and the power of personal experience. So then I began to think, there's got to be a way we can bring this experience together. And I started a project at Fountain House, which is a, the original clubhouse of the clubhouse movement in New York City, founded in 1947, I think. I started a project with participants there to try and see if we could find a way to bring more of that narrative approach to the fore with the hope that persons who either are receiving services or those who are providing services could begin to think about the complexity of human experience rather than categorizing and classifying people and doing that on the basis of sort of biological or genetic assumptions that then necessarily lead to medication as the solution of choice, or sometimes incarceration, either in locked wards or in prisons. Thank you. It strikes me that that's an, a, a unique uh, research agenda and using methods that are often not used in psychology and psychiatry. Can you talk a little bit about the history of uh, doing participatory research with people who've been diagnosed <coughs> as having a mental disorder? Well, I should clarify, I don't even use the word mental disorder or mental illness anymore. I, I, I First of all, I don't believe in the word illness because I'm not sure there is an illness to speak of. I'm really not sure what that means. And uh, I don't use disorder because I think we have to sort of be more flexible and allow for alternative ways of thinking. I understand these ways of thinking can cause tremendous distress. So right now I'm using psychiatric distress, but People I've worked with who have experienced extreme experiences even take issue with terminology like that. So I think we have to have a lot more discussion about the terminology of choice. But anyway, what happened was, my, I, based on my experience with, with the Austin Riggs population and looking at the interviews done there, which were based on an interview developed by a clinician called Christopher Fowler and Christopher Perry, I developed a new version of, of that clinical dynamic interview. So it has been shaped in part by a fairly progressive clinical psychology agenda, but it's also been shaped by an existential anthropology agenda of really understanding that people need to find ways to narrate their stories and express their experience, and that this shouldn't be about me or any other person who calls themselves a researcher, asking questions to categorize, classify, or, or really domesticate other people's experience, but should be rather about us creating spaces where people could describe their experiences and allow us to understand. So the interview participant would be my educator teaching me their experience rather than me organizing and deciding what their experience is. That's a better model by far for therapy than the conventional model, I think. And for clinical research, I feel the same. So we developed three one-hour interviews. The first one focuses on people's current feeling states. The second one focuses on their early history and their understanding of how their life experiences led to where they are. There's a particularly helpful book by a sociologist called Arthur Frank. Arthur Frank is, uh, works in Canada. And when he was 38, he had a heart attack. And when he was 39, he, had, he suffered a very dangerous cancer, testicle cancer. And he almost died twice. And so he spent an awful lot of time sitting in hospitals and he began to realize that the experience was profoundly dehumanizing. And he, began, he has now become an expert on doctor-patient relationship. But he conceptualized the life journey this way. You have a life journey, in his case, a physical illness, ruptures your life experience. And then he asks the question, what becomes of somebody post-rupture? Does that person stay trapped in a period of awfulness? Do they start to get into a phase of denial or do they build a new life incorporating their new position post-rupture or post-disease? So we've taken that model and we've transferred it. We've taken that model and we've transferred it to psychiatric experience. And we pose the question, what is your life experience prior to this breakdown? And what's your life? Ex what was the experience of the breakdown? And what is your life experience post-breakdown? 
to see the kinds of ways in which people have charted life courses. And since we focused on people who have chronic long-term issues, many of the participants we've spoken with have histories of 20, 30, and 40 years of making their life journeys with these diagnoses. We're also interested in the critical psychology questions of how people interact with institutions, diagnostic systems, pharmacological systems, hospital and partial hospital programs, psychiatrists and therapy systems, to see the ways in which they perceive those as being facilitative or helpful and the ways in which they believe those experiences might impede their recovery. And unfortunately, we find many, many people in the hearing voices movement and in the psychiatric survivor movement who feel that their journeys were impeded by their interactions with the system rather than facilitated. So that's the core philosophy of the work. What distinguishes our work more than anything else, I think, are two things. First, uh, my students who did these interviews with me immersed themselves at Fountain House for six months. So they built relationships with people before they recruited participants for the samples so that we would have people that knew them and they knew. Secondly, this is what we call a collaborative interpretive community. It involves um, people from my research team at Adelphi who were academics, doctoral students and myself, uh, people from Fountain House who are staff who administer the programs, and then people from Fountain House who are called members, who are participants in the program. And we've created a collaborative team, and that team together are working on interpreting the research. We have a book contract, and the number of authors in the book will probably be 12 or 13 or 14 people, because all of those participants, academic people from Adelphi, Fountain House professionals, and Fountain House members, will all be writing this work together. And so we call that a collaborative interpretive community because we really try to not privilege excessively the academic or clinical perspective, though recognizing that some shaping of the work by me and my perspective is inevitable. So we'll have somewhat of an academic tone, but we're really working very hard to try and privilege the authenticity of the voices of the participants. And we don't call actually, we don't call our work interviews, we call them conversations. That's great. And uh, for the benefit of our listeners, can you mm-hmm. contrast that with the sort of standard um, research in psychiatry and psychology when it comes to looking at experiences we label as psychotic? Sure. Well, to give you some perspective, I work in an academic department with about 30 professors in our doctoral program. And we have three people who do qualitative research out of 30. So that's we're right down to 10% already. So if a, if a prospective doctoral student came to our institution, there's not many options. The vast majority of people here do positivistic traditional research. I was in a meeting with four colleagues yesterday, and one of them said, well, when you see how people support Trump, psychology is a very left-wing discipline because we're really very progressive. And I said, actually, I think the opposite. I think psychology is a very reactionary field and that we're very conservative. I've looked, I I resigned from APA many years back because of their history of racism, and then they got involved in supporting psychologists who worked at Guantanamo Bay to devise torture. So psychology has a very poor history of liberatory, unless you look to places like critical psychology and community psychology. Likewise, in psychiatry, while there are always have been some outstanding progressive and critical psychiatrists, the field as a whole has really been positivistic and driven by pharmacological concerns. So my, my, real, my real feeling is that there's, there's very little space within the field. And in fact, when we went to Fountain House to request to do research, they were profoundly suspicious of us. And I could totally understand their suspicion. It took us two years to negotiate entry because they were afraid we were coming to do violence rather than to do justice. And it strikes me that the critical psychology movement and the critical psychiatry movement are at this point um, separate and may not often speak to one another. Where does where do you think the work overlaps and how do the two movements strengthen one another? Where are they talking? I have a sense that critical psychology is mainly an academic sort of field. Uh, well, perhaps it draws from community psychology. So there's some practitioner work there, but it strikes me that it's I'm not terribly expert in the critical psychology field. I read in it, but I'm not really expert. My sense is that it's more academic and people write about, but I'm not sure there's a lot of doing. The critical psychiatry movement has some academics, of course, but it has a lot of people who have worked in the trenches, either experiencing extreme states themselves 
or working with people in very honest and difficult ways in difficult situations. And I feel that it arises more from a sense of recognizing the marginalization and disempowerment of whole communities of people. So I see it as more, more directly activist than the critical psychology movement, which my sense of, but I could be challenged on this, my sense of it is as more academic. But critical psychiatry has come out of activist people who really are dissatisfied with the frightening things that have happened in the history of psychiatry, the lobotomies, the electroshock therapy, the metrazole convulsive therapy, the the endless series of apparatuses for manipulation, control, direction, and containment of people. I don't think that's as palpable in critical psychology. It seems like they're, they're talking more in principle. I think those fields could very fruitfully talk with each other, absolutely. And I think it would be very valuable if they did. I noticed that uh, you've written quite a bit about the experience of children uh, in the United States and elsewhere. Can you talk a little bit about what the psychological experience is for children in, in this contemporary period? Sure. Uh, to begin with, I've actually written a lot about my own childhood and how my early illness and my father's anxiety attacks and my mother's anxiety and my grandfather, my, a long history of alcoholism and a grandmother who was very significantly paranoid and violent, how all of that history, which of course is couched in a much larger Irish, Irish history of oppression, shape my own interest in these issues. So it begins there. And I think all of my work with children is grounded in a sense from my own experience that human beings need uh, spaces of nurturance and validation. And a lot of my work has been a critique of the power of developmental psychology to create a notion of no a norm, an idea that there is a singular path upwards. There is an academic called Catherine Bond Stockton who says, what would happen if we stopped conceptualizing growth as upwards and thought of growth as sideways. We'd accommodate an awful lot more people with divergent experience if they didn't feel they had to fit into a very narrow norm. And so much of my, a good deal of my child writing has been critiquing this normativity of the field. Secondly, um, I've been very, very concerned. I wrote a piece a few years back called Countering the Use of Medication with Children, very concerned about the medicalization of children. I have an extensive child practice where I see many children and, um, we know, for instance, that I, I believe it's Joseph Biederman at Harvard has been almost single-handedly instrumental in shifting the diagnosis of most children with difficulties from ADD or ADHD to bipolar. That's very powerful because that has opened the door hugely for pharmacological companies to prescribe antipsychotic medications to children as young as four. That happens here. It happens in Australia and in other parts of the world as well. I'm extremely disturbed by, number one, the willingness to medicate children with medications that haven't been tested on them. Robert Whitaker has written extensively about this and whose effects we don't know. Medications that are dangerous with many side effects, medications that Whitaker talks about in anatomy of an epidemic that may actually create dependencies that are lifelong. And uh, I'm really, really concerned fundamentally that there is a profound lack of interest in understanding that children's distress has an origin and that our responsibility is to engage with the child and find a way that that child can communicate that distress and we can create a space for them to experience their desire rather than us taking on what schools fail to do by creating other systems that imprison, incarcerate, or medicate children rather than allowing them to experience their potential. So I'm very, very concerned about the, the state of children in our society and the willingness of schools, pediatricians, and pediatric psychiatrists to reach for medication whenever a child is perceived as deviant. We define normality in a way that makes it very difficult for children who don't fit that norm, either because they're too creative to fit within a really rigid school system in, in which, for instance, now even kindergartners are filling out paper worksheets all day, or in which the things they bring in with them from their family life, their home life, the inheritances of their parents from their own histories, suddenly become things that school has no space for. There's no room for a child in school. There's only room for a student. And I have a real difficulty with a societal system that refuses a place for the child psyche. And I think that that really, if you look at the history of folks who have adult psychiatric difficulties, you'll find that in many of them, there were struggles with peers and struggles with managing life in institutions early. And I'm pretty convinced that if those things were managed, not through confrontation, but through love and support, 
life would be very different. In other words, if we asked when a child presents with difficulty, what lies beneath? I've done extensive work in Sydney, Australia, for instance, with a colleague who runs uh, teacher training programs and preschools for Aboriginal children who have suffered abominably at the hands of the Australian government over many generations, much like um, Indigenous families in many parts of the world, including this country. And we have really worked to try and see if we can create spaces for love, value, valuing and acceptance for children who struggle rather than spaces of judgment, criticism or spaces where they can be disposed of and removed from the mainstream and given up on. So I, I have a lot of concern about child mental health. Thank you. Finally, I want to ask you what you think the psychoanalytic framework uh, adds to contemporary psychology and, and therapeutic modalities? Well, I should clarify again, psychoanalysis is a very tricky discipline. There, there is a bourgeois psychoanalysis, which is very invested in seeing children in bourgeois ways and doesn't make much accommodation for class, race, immigration status, or gender variability and divergence. But there are, there, the, the power of psychoanalysis is it does contain within it some critical spaces that are very valuable. So, for instance, there are Ranjana Khanna, for instance, a post-colonial psychoanalysis analyst, has talked about how we can try to find ways around these encompassing bourgeois assumptions and try to find space to, to do something more critical. And there are parts of Lacanian work that really privilege the notion of desire that we are shaped by our culture. And many people would argue, for instance, that Western cultures are, in fact, the schizophrenic, if you want to use that term, inducing because of the demands they place on human beings, which are so unnatural, to have to get up, to have to go to work, to have to work in meaningless jobs all day long, to have to live on the edge of poverty, that these are enormous stressors. And so Lacanian psychoanalysis shows how subjectivity is constructed through the experience of being in a society and if that person is experiencing distress from that being in society, is there something, quote, wrong with that person? Or is there something wrong with the society that has created this sense of subjectivity? So psychoanalysis does have tools, I believe, for deconstructing how our psyche is shaped and therefore has the power to help us understand how we could do better, both at the individual level in creating spaces for love, containment and acceptance, and also for looking at the components of subjectivity we make available to people. Just to give one brief example, I've begun writing about refugee children and families recently because I'm very concerned about the status of refugees. And we do know there's a big correlation between statuses as vulnerable as refugees and the risk of having psychiatric distress later. And in that writing, I have really used a combination of psychoanalysis and critical theory to try and show that there is a way to conceptualize extreme states by recognizing the contributions society makes to exacerbating people's lives. So psychoanalysis, I think, has, sure, it has tools that you can get from within conventional psychoanalysis for understanding our emotions and our struggles, but also has tools for analyzing the societal issues that help shape the psyche so that we could really begin to think about perhaps we could do this differently. We live in a, we live in a world where human subjectivity is very atomized and isolated and people's capacity for connection is missing. And if I could just then maybe make a brief editorial comment, the work at Fountain House and other reading I've done has taught me that healing comes in healing spaces, spaces where people can gather together in community without judgment. And I think psychoanalysis has some abilities to help us understand that and help us push for different models of care. It would be, you know, self-help based to some extent, community based, and resourced around creating living spaces that are healthful so people can resume their life journeys in ways that are productive and supportive for them. For those of us who are starting in this field of psychology, either as students or as early career professionals or are working in the helping professions, and we haven't been exposed to psychoanalytic ideas or critical community forms of psychology, I want to ask, where do you, where do you suggest we begin? Well, I, 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 let me give a brief suggestion. I'm having a project for one of my students and I are working on creating on my website a category called Bookshelf. And on that category, I'm literally making an inventory and typing out book lists of all the books on my shelves for different categories. One is on uh, psychosis and psychiatric difficulties. One is on intergenerational trauma. One is on psychoanalysis. 
ones on children, and there were one is on post-colonial thought, and there were a few others. And so those are reading lists. I also include on my website all of the syllabi for all of my courses I teach. And so people can always begin there. I mean, I have found the, the that if I were beginning, I think I'd want to begin with experts by experience and with personal narrative because I find that work very persuasive at making the case for why we need to be, at a minimum, humanistic, caring, and loving, and then move on from that into the critical spaces where we begin to try to reimagine. I, I edited a book some years ago called Imagining Children Otherwise. I think we need to imagine lives otherwise. And this means pushing against the tide of a society that's neoliberal, where everything is quantified, everything is valued, and everything is built based upon economic considerations rather than on human considerations. So pushing back against that tide is very difficult. And I recently wrote a review of a book on the British National Health Service that really raises serious questions about what's happening in Britain. One doctor in that book talks about how physicians now get a maximum of 10 minutes per patient. And if a patient comes, you're only allowed to discuss one complaint. And if they have two, they have to come back another day to discuss the second complaint. It also means that therapies that involve talk are being eliminated instead of in play and replaced by therapies of checking off boxes of symptoms. And the doctor who speaks about this in the book speaks very eloquently about how we need to reclaim and recuperate narrative. So fundamentally for me, this is a narrative project. It's a project about reclaiming spaces for story, because when we bring story back, we humanize spaces and people are able to say what they need rather than coming to us for us to tell them what they need, as if we can presume to understand another's experience because we have pharmacological training or psychological training. Dr. Olafen, thank you so much for sharing your experience and your wisdom with us today. Uh, for listeners who are interested, where can they find your website? My website is, is my name, michaelolachlanphd.com. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Nice talking with you, Justin. Bye-bye. I just wanted to take a moment to thank both Justin and Michael for such an interesting discussion. Madden America News and Updates. We wanted to let you know that Madden America Continuing Education is presenting a series of seven webinars on psychiatric drug withdrawal that will feature presentations by people with lived experience, psychiatrists and other professionals. The course begins on October 24th and there is a 50% discount for the first 75 people who sign up for the course. To get more details and to sign up, visit maddenamerica.com and use the link at the top right hand side of the homepage. So thank you so much for listening. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.